Welcome to Adjusted Reality, a podcast series trusted by the adjusted and brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress, where we learn from athletes, celebrities, influencers, and healthcare professionals about how to optimize health in a fun, relatable way. Join me, Dr. Sherry McAllister, as I speak with Dr. Tommy Wood about how age impacts brain function, health, and healing. Dr. Woods is an assistant professor of pediatrics and neuroscience at the University of Washington, where his research interests include determining how early brain injury impacts brain health across our lifespan, as well as developing easily accessible and equitable methods with which to track health, performance, and longevity in professional athletes and the general population. He received an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge, a medical degree from the University of Oxford, and a PhD in physiology and neuroscience from the University of Oslo. Dr. Woods has acted as a performance consultant for professional athletes in dozens of different sports served as associate editor of the Wiley Journal Lifestyle Medicine, is a director of the British Society for Lifestyle Medicine, and consults for a number of digital health companies and charities that focus on how lifestyle and the environment can affect long-term health and chronic disease. Welcome, Dr. Tommy. I know you like to go by Tommy, so I'll do my best to keep that going. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, really looking forward to our conversation. We've had a number of different high-level um, Olympic athletes mention your name, and I feel very blessed that you were able to join us because I know how busy you are and the degree to which your daily life, your consulting and your teaching and your research must have a major impact in it. So if there's someone to listen to about how to find balance in life, it's going to be you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly, I certainly uh, hope so. It's something that we all struggle with, um, but uh, you know, uh, something I, I strive to achieve as well as recommending for others as well. Fantastic. Well, well, let's get right into this because your expertise and you have a very eclectic academic <laughs> yeah. um, purview, but the the reality for us is we're talking about the brain. We're going to talk about brain function today. So give our audience kind of the importance of brain function and performance. Sure. So both uh, performance and then, you know, also our, our day-to-day lives, um, both critically important and in reality almost everything and pretty much everything we do is essentially driven by our our brains and that connects to every organ in the body and there's they they talk uh to one another there's something that we sort of you know quote unquote realized in the last 10 or 20 years in neuroscience is that the brain is connected to the rest of the body and actually they influence one another and that's not something that we previously really talked about um but if we're thinking about uh, performance, then yeah, the sort of the, the the critical aspect of of brain health, and I think this is relevant to pretty much anybody, is that your brain is capable of doing and supporting whatever it is that you want to be able to do, um, and that's like the 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 simple matter of it. And as we age and we lose cognitive function, there becomes a disconnect. Like we don't have. Uh, say, uh, what we might call um, head headroom, right? We don't have extra capacity. And that's what we really need. If you want any uh, structure or, or organ in the body to be able to support you um, in your long-term pursuits, it's not. It, it can't just be able to do the things that you do every day. It has to have extra capacity, right? So imagine um, if you're doing squats in the gym, right? If your maximum weight that you could do is just you getting up out of a chair, right, there's no extra capacity in there. And then that's when people are at risk of stumbling and falling, which is a, a big risk as we get older. And the brain is the same. We do the same things every day, answer emails, sit in meetings, um, drive a car. Um, but if we want to be able to you know, maximally perform, 
we also have to do extra. And it's that that headroom, that function, being able to support whatever it is we want to do whenever we want to do it. That's really how I see this critical function of, of brain health. Um, and you know, the standard set of recommendations that people have probably heard again and again are really the things that support that, like regardless of where you are in your in your lifespan. So, you know, I imagine we'll talk about sleep and diet and physical activity um, and social connection. Um, all of these things are critical supporters uh, of of long term brain health, which then allows you to do whatever it is you want to do with your brains. And I think that's really this this key part of long uh, uh, independence and health. We reflect on the brain as almost like the control system. And oftentimes we end up as human nature doing the same things over and over mm. again, repetitively. We drive to work in the same way. We eat our breakfast with the left, you know, we, with one um, one particular dominant hand. I mean, there's things that we just don't change because we're wired that way. And many times we wonder, is the wiring starting from the top down or the bottom up? And it gets kind of an, an interesting um piece when we start adding in aging and or trauma. So start with headroom and then walk me through how much do we know about the brain right now, since you've been heavily involved in, in the space. And from that experience, how does age and um, trauma impact it? So uh, another way uh, to think about uh, headroom, and actually, so the I learned it that this this phrase, uh, I think I heard first heard it from Art Devaney, who is an American. So I promise it's not just uh, a British. Okay, thing. good. Uh, <laughs> we we set that one to rest. <laughs> um, and he was talking about it in terms of what he calls physiologic headroom, which was kind of um, how how I you know mentioned our our physical capacity. Um, imagine that you stumble and fall, or somebody pushes you. That you know, being able to very suddenly react to be able to stabilize yourself, right? That is a life-saving maneuver, but it requires physiologic headroom. It requires your muscles to have additional capacity beyond what they do every day. Because what you do every day is just like walk around. You're not reacting in, in that way, but you should be able to when you need to. Um, and so that's what we call headroom. Headroom being the difference between what you need to do every day versus what you are capable of. That difference, that's the headroom. And the more headroom you have, the more space there, you know, the bigger the capacity things you're able to do if you have to. Um, and I, I see the brain uh, in the same way. It will support us every day in doing those routine things. But when you want it to do more, it should, that capacity should be, should be there. Excellent. And, that's what I, that's what I mean by headroom. I love it, and I I, I quite enjoy teasing you because you know when I when I get on the uh, the overseas trips, I always hear watch the headroom from, mm. from the from the stewards. So it's it's yeah. good. The the importance now now that that we have a, a really clear definition of it is the extra space that we need to be able to do these high performance pieces. Mm. And sometimes high performance can vary depending on you're an Olympic athlete or you're in fact an aging adult who's 88 years old. I'm going to use my mm. mother-in-law. She'll, she'll love this and, <laughs> and love that I gave her age away. So <laughs> let's think about this from her um, perspective. So what I really enjoy is that she's constantly trying to do things more to impact the brain as an aging adult. So she'll do mm -hmm. crossword puzzles. She'll There's things that she knows are important to create this um, increased awareness. And it's it, people recognize that the brain has to be active and continually be active. So let's dive into just aging. Let's put trauma aside, because I know there's a separate um, significant piece to this. Mm, yeah. Some would say aging is trauma, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> but, <laughs> but let's talk about aging and what actually physically happens when we age. And how does that impact the body? There are a number of ways you can tackle this question. I'll tackle it from a biochemical standpoint. Um, there are what we call nine hallmarks of aging. These are things that you can measure in tissues, in cells. Um, and they're usually things that we measure, say, in mice in the lab, because there are some things that I physically could not measure in, in a human without 
you know, causing a lot of pain and destruction, un unfortunately. Um, but the hallmarks of aging include things like uh, decreased mitochondrial function or energy sensing. So uh, being uh, less able to process energy and provide energy to the kind of things that, that your cell, all your cells need to do. It also includes changes in uh, the structure of our DNA, you know, which genes uh, we're transcribing. Um, and so across all these hallmarks, what you're essentially seeing is these um, things where we're losing um, overall capacity. So it could be losing stem cells. That's that's one of the hallmarks of aging. We, we exhaust our stem cells, which are there to kind of regenerate tissue. And then we see that different components of cells or different organs, maybe they function less well. They're uh, transcribing different genes. Um, often uh, we see this uh, thing called senescence, which is where these cells are, they're, they're alive, but they're not really doing anything. And they're actually just kind of like these like grumbly cantankerous cells that just sort of like hang around and they shoot out all these in inflammatory things that they kind of negatively affect uh, the, the cells around them. Um, and so we kind of shift into this um, uh, state where, you know, we're processing energy less well, we're maybe uh, producing different proteins or different genes, and they're like not supporting this kind of youthful, energetic, uh, regenerative state. Um, and with that, then we we lose or we the, the, the function of a, an organ, say the brain, then decreases. And there's a number of different theories about why this happens. And, you know, I'd sort of closely follow the active discussions that happen in, in this arena, and nobody really knows why they happen. Um, if, if people are interested, there are a number of different theories. So one is something called the information theory, which is that over time, uh, our DNA gets, da gets damaged. As we repair that damage, we shift these things around, like people may have heard of epigenetics or methylation, in order to repair DNA, we have to move those markers around, um, and then we never quite put them back where they were before. So we kind of the information changes over time, and people have likened it to like a CD being scratched. Um, other people say, well, it might be um, that developmental programs, so things that are there to um, support us as we develop in the first place, they just kind of continue. And as those processes continue, it kind of drives this change over time. So the reason why I say this is because nobody actually knows what's the, like, the fundamental process that drives aging. We can measure some of these things, but we still don't know exactly you know, why it happens. Um, but sort of the, the downstream part of that is that we, we lose function. Um, one of the things that I think is most important, and we've seen this across you know multiple different types of studies. It could be in uh, cells in a dish, it can be in animal studies, it can be in human studies. If we're thinking about the function of a tissue, one of the like the critical driving force of maintaining function in that tissue is stimulating it. So, uh, and when you stimulate a tissue, not only do you create growth. Um, and new connections, say if it's in if, if it's in the brain, but you also stimulate re repair processes, things like autophagy, which break down and you know uh, junky proteins and regenerate them. Um, so you're stimulating growth, but you're also stimulating repair. Um, and an example would be exercise, right? This is something that I think people can sort of identify with. If you want to have younger, you know, quote unquote, younger, stronger, healthier muscles. The best way to do that is to stimulate them, lift weights, do some kind of physical activity. Um, and doing that, you create strength, you create new muscle tissue, and then you also repair the muscle tissue that you have. The brain is exactly the same. So if you want to improve or maintain function of the brain, the most important thing to do is to stimulate it. Uh, and you have to then provide the the environment that supports it, right? So it needs nutrients, it needs blood supply, it needs sleep, which is the time, you know, when we actually rest and recover and we create these new connections. Um, consolidation is is one word for that. But like your um, like your mother-in-law, um, she's stimulating her brain, which is great. That's exactly like if I was going to say one thing to keep your brain uh, healthy for as long as possible is making sure that your brain remains uh, stimulated. And again, number of different ways that, that we can approach this. Um, but we can think about things like 
you know, what are the kind of stimuli that the brain expects that then you sort of drive benefit? Um, and so this is where I like to bring in some of my research in the sort of neonatal and developmental sphere. So think about the the newborn or the toddler as they develop. Uh, what are the things that they're doing? They're continuously developing new skills by interacting with the environment. Um, and they're trying new stuff all the time. They're failing a lot, right? They're trying to stand up and walk. They're falling over, trying to climb a tree. They're falling. Um, they're trying to build uh, language and communication. And the words aren't correct most of the time as they begin and they get better over time. Um, and so that's one of the things that's most important is that willingness to try and be like on the edge of your current ability and slowly getting better. And then they do all those things, you know, learning motor skills, very difficult, learning social skills and language skills, incredibly difficult, huge stimulus to the brain. And then they sleep a lot and they rest and recover and they allow those uh, processes to take place to get that adaptation. Adults don't do that. Uh, yeah. What we do instead is the same thing every day, again and again and again. And you can actually... So I, when I give talks on this, I, I have this graph where I show, like, here are the things that we do early in life, how much they stimulate the brain. You know, so it's like that learning to walk and talk. And then, you know, we go to school and early life education is one of the most protective factors for long-term cognitive function, right? Because we've, cre we've created headroom early on by stimulating the brain more. And then we learn to drive and we learn... You know, maybe I learned some biochemistry as an undergraduate and some other things. And, you know, that's difficult, but it's not as difficult as learning how to walk. Um, and then we go to work and we sit in meetings all day and we answer emails and we're like, oh, my brain is busy. But essentially, we're just doing the same thing again and again. And then as you track the stimulus that we're providing to our brains, you can also track the function of our brains. And they follow each other very nicely. Our brains work the best in our sort of late teens, early 20s. And then as we stimulate them less, they work less well. Um, but if we do things like learn multiple languages, if we learn a musical instrument, um, if we're a teacher, these skills that we then use throughout our entire lives, these protect us. They protect our cognitive function and they make our brains look younger on an MRI scan. Uh, they maintain our cognitive function later in life. Um, retiring later protects against cognitive function, um, making sure that we maintain all our senses, protects our cognitive function. So if we lose sight because of cataracts, uh, we have an increased risk of cognitive decline, which is reversed if we have cataract surgery. Same for hearing loss and hearing aids. So anything that we can do to continue to stimulate our brains, this is what, this is what we're doing. We're increasing the function of the tissue. We're increasing our headroom. We're also increasing repair and recovery and what that is essentially doing is counteracting some of those um, aging processes that I mentioned earlier. It's fascinating because I believe this audience will also recognize their own daily patterns, the own mm -hmm. things that they keep doing over and over again. <laughs> and it's hard as you get older to, to learn more languages. I noticed myself, I had a trip to Brazil and I was trying to learn the Portuguese language. And I just recognized this is so much harder than it used to be because I grew up with French. Um, and it seemed so easy when I was younger how to pick up the language. And now as I get older and I try to look into more language learning, it it seems that it doesn't stick as well. And I, I would assume that I have a lot more work, just like exercises, getting out there and trying new sports. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that now the Olympic athletes are starting to recognize is if if you're doing one sport and you're really good at it, and this is your Olympic dream and your Olympic goal, you can't just do that sport. And that's why that whole, it, it was almost like a reverse of thinking is now we've got, say you're a, an ultra runner is now swimming and starting to use different proprioception, different spatial arrangements, increased muscle mass in a variety of different ways. And I think that really, as we begin to move into our um, older years, as we're all degenerating together, even listening to this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, that's a reality is <sighs> that um, it's being able to recognize what change will do for us. And, and I want you to talk about because you you did a really good job biochemistry on talking about mitochondria. And for the audience, those are your energy packets that produce a very special chemical called ATP. And it, it has a number of different ways to be produced, but 
if you're eating well, nutrition, you have a better chance of producing more energy and utilizing the system well. And I know there's certain things we don't want to hear because we enjoy them. For example, alcohol, it, it doesn't do great for the brain. And I think you would probably agree with me, but let's talk about nutrition and mm. fundamentally, what are some of the very important pieces that we need to know about nutrition and brain health? So before I talk about nutrition and brain health, I want to touch on something that you you said earlier, which is learning languages and it gets difficult as as you get older. And you know, you could you could think about any skill that way. And I just I want to push back on that just a little bit because I think what we what society tells us is that over time our brain function declines. There's nothing we can do about it except for make it worse, like by drinking too much alcohol or not sleeping, not sleeping enough or, yep. or getting really stressed. And, you know, this, this sort of like can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? There's just, you know, I, I hear again and again and again, you know, I'm old, like I just can't learn something new. Um, and I don't think that's true. Um, like we have some evidence that yes, you know, in short timescales, so say if, you, if you're asking somebody to learn to adapt to a new scenario within a few minutes, Somebody who's older will take longer to do that. But on the timescales that we really care about, which is days or weeks or months, even you know, an older brain is just as capable. But other things change. So, you know, you grew up with French. I imagine when you learned French, you were probably much more immersed in that and you had more time to devote to it. And there were other things, you know, far fewer, you know, other concerns and things you had to do that then allowed you to focus more on learning French. So I would say that it's maybe the scenario that you're in and what you're the resources, you know, physical, time, mental, that you can apply to that learning are, are different when you're older versus younger. So I would say that it's very unlikely that over, you know, decent amounts of time, if you, if you gave the same, um, you know, dedication to it as you did when you were younger to learn Portuguese, I, I fully believe that your brain is perfectly capable of learning Portuguese. And I, so I want people to know that your brain will ad adapt, it will learn later in life. Maybe some of the inertia is more difficult. Maybe you have less time to invest. You know, maybe you're stressed about other things. And all of that is perfectly understandable. But there is nothing about the brain as it gets older that physically says you can't learn new skills or can't learn new languages. And I think that's something that society tells us, but it's not, but it's not true. Uh -huh. So an adjusted reality moment for the host. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Very well done, Tommy. <laughs> And the the main reason why it's so important to me is because I think that that's that's quite empowering, right? Otherwise, we might say, you know, I'm just getting old. I can't do it. But that's not true. Like I fully believe in everybody's capacity to learn uh, new things and new skills. I, I believe in your brains. You know, the brain is an amazing is, is an amazing thing at any at any life stage. So I just I just wanted to say that. Um, Thank you. Um. So nutrition, which is actually your question. Um. There were. A whole number of ways to skin uh, the nutrition cat, and and we could, you know, spend several podcasts in a row talking about it. Uh, me personally, I'm relatively uh, diet agnostic, mainly because I've seen people thrive really well on just like a whole range of different diets. That if you really try to think about it, it's difficult to understand how that might happen. However, I think there are a couple of like fundamental. Um, things that seem to translate across dietary approaches. One is nutrient density. Um, so, and and if we think about the brain, there are a whole number of nutrients that are critically important. Um, omega three fatty acids, uh, B vitamins are incredibly important. Uh, uh, precursors for uh, the the things that sit in your cell membranes, phospholipids. So, so, so things like choline can be really important. Um, so there's a whole number of nutrients uh, that, that are, are really important for the brain. Iron is really important. Vitamin D is really important. So how you get that, uh, I don't really mind. Um, but generally, it will come from a nutrient-dense, minimally processed diet. And we know that there's a recent study that came out of Brazil, in, in fact, that looked at uh, adults and their, their food consumption. And those who, uh, the more of the calories that came from ultra processed foods, the faster their cognitive decline. Uh, and that's probably, you know, there's a number of reasons why that might be. Um, 
you know, as foods become highly processed, they have bigger impacts on our physiology, so cause bigger spikes in blood sugar. We know that blood sugar control is, is a really important factor in long-term brain function and then also general health. And also they tend to be much lower in nutrients. Um, so some of those critical nutrients that we talked about, as you, you know, turn uh, crop foods or whatever into this ultra-processed food, most of those nutrients uh, are lost. So those are the things that I, that I generally focus on is like, are, are you getting adequate nutrients for the brain from your diet? And that usually means that it's um, whole foods, minimally processed as much as possible. So there's like the benefits of that, plus avoiding some of the the, the negative effects of you know really a sort of ha- highly processed industrial foods. It's really quite important when you look at our our daily diets, and that it seems that the more people I talk to, the more balance there is in terms of not going too far one direction or the mm. other, but really looking at the density of the food that we're eating and also the quality of the food that we're eating. And, and that I think is, is playing a role as well as we kind of develop the um, perspective that you are what you eat. And Mm -hmm. it does, it does create a a change and you can feel it. If, if the audience was to say, eat a bag of Cheetos for lunch as their, as their lunch, or have a slice of salmon or a, um, uh, a salad, you can feel that there's a difference in your energy and your ability to concentrate. If you haven't done it, do it. I mean, ha- have a variety of different options and and see how you feel. Because most people at lunchtime, that's one of the, I kind of see lunch as a, a very important time because you see so many people hitting that two o'clock slump and they're falling mm. asleep on Zoom calls or you're in a meeting and you're like, kicking them, go, <laughs> come on, you can get through the postprandial depression, which I've eaten something that's not ideal. And it's really taken my glucose level um, to a whole different place. So I, I really like that you did point that out. And it it creates a um, a better and, and more important um, actionable item for us to know that brain health is going to be determined by what you're putting in as well as what you're putting out. And, and that kind of comes back to exercise. And Mm -hmm. because you deal with some very, very talented top performers, it's always nice to know what the elites do because, well, I want to treat myself like an elite. So if (laughs) if you could comment on, you know, from, from helping them be the best they can be, and you look back over time, what are some of the things that um, you've seen maybe be top performers on creating um, brain health, whether it's exercise or nutrition or um, sleep, or even some, many of us will forget hydration is massively important mm. in our life. You know, we get to a dehydrated, a dehydrated state. It's hard. It's hard to be able to function. And I know the brain has an impact to that as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the most interesting things to me working with uh, professional athletes, and I think this is, this is a, a takeaway that I've had in multiple different ways uh, across the, the, my career so far is that in reality, the same things matter regardless of who you are. So, so my, my favorite example is comes from sleep. So I, had a, I was working uh, with an athlete. Actually, I was working more directly with the athlete's coach. Um, and this is a, a world champion in, in their sport. And they were worried about their sleep. And I get... Uh, I, I get I get a text you know, with some sleep data from from an aura ring, which people may know of. It's you know, it can sort of track your sleep data. And the question is, um, you know, my my athlete is really worried about their REM sleep because they had low REM sleep on on their on, on their aura data. And when you look across all the the all the all the data that I got. The, this individual was spending five hours in bed every night. So the reason why REM sleep is low is because REM sleep happens more towards the end of the night when you know, you're know so hours six, seven, eight uh, of a night of sleep. But if you're only sleeping five hours, you're going to have low REM sleep because you just don't have enough time. You don't have enough sleep opportunity to get that sleep in. So even at the upper echelons of performance, 
these same things still matter. So, you know, I could say, regardless of who you are, the most important thing to improve your sleep quality, whether you're worried about individual sleep stages or sleep in general, is to just give yourself enough time to sleep. You know, and and e- even high performers don't necessarily do that. And it's, so it's the same across all of these factors, right? Um, nutrition is the same. In terms of physical activity, that's maybe slightly different because in order to perform at your highest level in a given sport, you need to have very specific skills. Um, and so a good example of this is, say, so- professional cyclists. Professional cyclists are, you know, say like a, so tour cyclists, like the Tour de France. They are incredibly good. Well, th- they have a range of they have a range of skills depending on the cyclist, but in general, they're incredibly good at sitting on this frame, hunched over, going up the side of a ridiculously steep mountain that you or I probably couldn't even walk up, and they'll zoom up it at twenty miles an hour, just like incredible feats of aerobic uh, performance. But if you ask them to jump off the bike and go like run a sprint or jump on a really high wall or you know you know do do some heavy bicep curls they couldn't do it right they they don't have that that capacity because they have to be very specific in in what that they can perform at and some people have said and i think it's a nice phrase that uh sort of professionally athletes they're very fit but they're not necessarily very healthy and if you think about health in the way that i said it earlier it's having this headroom to be able to perform multiple different ways across a, a broad range of of uh, sort of skills and areas so what's interesting about professional athletes um and and i think this this also translates over to a bunch of different arenas um and there's a very nice book called range written by david epstein um it shows or you know there's a lot of research that shows that early in life those who perform very highly in one area probably sampled a bunch of different things early on right so there are there are lessons from like Roger Federer who tried a whole bunch of different sports before he got into tennis and i think there was uh, same same things with the williams sisters right they were encouraged to try a whole bunch of different things before they focused on on tennis so there's a lot of lessons from tennis but the those range of skills right you're creating headroom you're creating this sort of range of abilities before you really focus down. And I think that translates nicely over to everybody else. Because if we think about trying to maintain our health and performance long term, a range of inputs seems to be particularly beneficial. And physical activity is a good example. We know that, um, say, muscle strength in particular, and the amount of muscle that we have they're important predictors of how long we live. You need to have enough. You don't like more isn't better, right? You don't need to be a bodybuilder. You just need to have some. Um, and in the general world where lots of people are sedentary and they don't move at all, uh, you know, uh, during the day, they maybe take 2000 steps and don't do anything else. They probably don't have the amount of muscle that you might need to, to be protective. People who do some kind of regular physical activity, that's that's enough. You know, 20 to 30 minutes a day of almost any physical activity is probably going to help you have enough mu- muscle for it to be protective. We know that's beneficial. We also know that um, there's a, a dose response of physical activity on uh, brain health and cognitive function. So again, the, the minimum dose that is thought to benefit um, the brain in terms of like a clinically measurable improvement in cognitive function is something like 20 to 30 minutes per day of moderate to physical activity. So it could be moderate to vigorous physical activity. So like anything from brisk walking to lifting weights, to going for a jog, to a bike ride, even like household chores, that probably covers uh, a lot of it. Um, but the most benefit that you seem to get for your brain is a uh, physical activity that has multiple different inputs at the same time. So there's the the, like the cardiovascular, like the that physical strain, plus some kind of cognitive stimulus. So if you, in, in some randomized studies where you have individuals um, and you put them in a dance class compared to a circuit training class, those who are in the dance class get greater improvements in you know various aspects of the brain. You can see it on an MRI scan and various aspects of their cognitive function. Because even though the cardiovascular effects, like the strain, the difficulty of the two is the same, adding on some kind of coordination or mode component dancing also has a social component that then 
gives extra benefit. And there was a meta-analysis that suggested that coordinative exercise, so exercise that includes some kind of balance or coordination component, is more protective of cognitive decline. So you're giving more inputs at the same time. So it's not just moving, it's these additional things that are beneficial as well. So you can think about yoga, skateboarding, um, any, th- any kind of ball sport or team sport that requires you to react in the moment. Uh, soccer, badminton has been tested in a number of studies. Uh, some studies call it uh, open skill versus closed skill. So open skill means that you're having to like react to the environment versus closed skill, which is like sitting on a bike and you're just kind of like going in a straight line. So a range of inputs seems to be really beneficial. And that also seems to translate from those who are um, like successful you know, at the peak of their particular sport to uh, uh, sort of in- individuals, uh, uh, every- everybody else. Um and I think part of that, again, if we think about then longevity of a sport or longevity in a sport as a professional athlete, um, so let's say we go to endurance athletes again. Um, this could be triathletes, runners, cyclists. Creating an additional stimulus, additional support seems to be beneficial for longevity. And this is where I worked with a lot of athletes is you know, people who want to perform. They don't want, They don't just want to perform this one season they still want to be on the start line in 10 years time. Like that's, right. that's their goal. They want longevity in their sport. And then one thing that's really important for endurance athletes is to make sure they do strength training because strength training decreases injury risk. You know, it improves structure. Um, so even though you don't need to be really strong to be an endurance athlete, that additional stimulus, that additional support, that then, you know, the sort of like additional headroom, that capacity, that, increases the likelihood that you'll be able to show up again and again and again and have longevity so those are kind of different strands of things where i think we can we can see actually you know elite athletes what helps them perform and you know, perform again and again is very similar to what you and i might do even though we don't have to be at the sort of the the pointiest the pointiest tip of performance in one area I like that you brought in that there is a, a a variety of different ways to engage. I mean, you could be totally working out and listening to adjusted reality, cognitively <laughs> changing the way you think. <laughs> so you can bring it all together. Overall health is really the key. And you mentioned this, and I'd like you to kind of go over it is, is you could be um, a high performing athlete and not be healthy. And then you also mentioned lifestyle and also how the environment impacts lifestyle and health. Can you kind of dive into those concepts just so we kind of had a clarity because I really enjoy how you broke it out um, just just now and being able to really stretch yourself, stretch the headroom, be active, um, the um, open circuit training and versus just continually doing the same thing and not having to have the stimulus, but come back to health, lifestyle and environment. If we tie that idea to the brain and cognitive performance, which is kind of what we're here to talk about today. Um, there have been various attempts to estimate how much do things like lifestyle and the environment impact our long-term brain health. There was a in tw- in 2020 uh, the Lancet, which is a a huge, uh, very prestigious medical journal. They they uh, had a commission to talk about dementia prevention, and dementia is obviously the end stage of cognitive decline. And there are multiple types, but in general, people might think of something like Alzheimer's disease, which is the commonest form of dementia is increasing in the population in the UK, at least is now the commonest cause of death that overtook heart disease and cancer in the last few years. And in this commission, what I think was quite a conservative estimate, they said that at least 40% of all dementia could be prevented uh, by changing lifestyle and the environment. And my guess is that if you take into the account th- like factors that interact, which they couldn't really do, and we know that there are multiple factors that interact, um, and other aspects they didn't take into account, like they didn't factor in, like what was the proportion uh, related to sleep deprivation, for instance, or, or not enough sleep. I think it's probably more than that. I think the majority of dementia we could probably prevent or at least um, slow decline by a, a prolonged period of time. Uh, by affecting lifestyle and the environment. And 
this is, you know, we've seen this in a, in a number of different studies, and we've sort of talked about some of the things that we know are important. So uh, cardiovascular health is critically important. So getting, you know, having healthy blood vessels to go to your brain, uh, if you want your brain to respond to a stimulus, if you want your brain to recover, it needs to have blood flow, oxygen, glucose to even get there in the first place. Um, and having a healthy, you know, good vascular system, we call it, you know, healthy blood vessels, healthy heart to do that is critically important. We already talked about nutrients. Uh, that's very important. Um, we talked about sleep. Um, but then uh, other things like chronic stress can certainly play a role. Trauma can play a role. And by trauma, this could be um, psychological trauma or it could be physical trauma. And they can both have detrimental effects on our long-term brain health. Um, but if we align all of these things and we're in a position to do that and not – not everybody is, and that's another thing that we need to sort of acknowledge as a society, that it's maybe easier for you and me to change our diet and change our physical activity and change our sleep, but not everybody has the the capability of, of doing that. Um, if we line these things up, the likelihood that you can live you know, the majority of your life without any significant decline in cognitive function that affects your, you know, your daily capacity is very high. So... These are the things that I think people can take and say, you know, what 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 are the potential risk factors? Um, could it be diet, vascular health, um, sleep, stress, uh, toxic exposures? So one thing that's quite well researched now is say uh, pollution, uh, particularly part particulate pollution that comes from things like car exhausts. You know, which of these things are the things that I'm at risk at? Those are maybe the things that I can focus on and then increase the likelihood that I can keep my brain. Uh, as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Excellent. Well said. And it it makes me reflect back to balance in life and balance in life is a critical component. And each of us has different weights on different sides, whether it, like you said, trauma um, can be a variety of different things. In today's world, we've had a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. When we look back to just two years ago and how we started um, looking at health in a whole different way and social isolation and mm -hmm. depression and anxiety, these all play a current and existing piece to many people's lives. Yeah. I'd like to just focus one moment on stability. You know, being able to be balanced and mobile are part of being involved in exercise. It also means your brain function, balance yeah. and stability of what you can rely on and hope. You know, this is a very powerful word because you said something that is critical. If if dementia is starting to take people's lives and we can reduce it by 40%. There's hope. And I I learned this recently and it's such a powerful statement is hope is usually the first to enter the room and hopefully the last to leave. And that to me creates that critical zone of being in control because we know that when we're not in control, it changes how we process. Mm. And I reflect back on the chiropractic philosophy of the body in motion remains in motion unless external impact creates some type of differential. So it stops, meaning that the body can heal itself if it's given the right environment. So you bring back the environment to our daily activities and we have those options of remaining in motion and you can't underestimate, especially when you look at the elderly and the number of falls that take people's lives. Mm. And oftentimes chiropractic can be one of the most important variables when you're talking to an aging adult. Are they doing what you said? Yoga, the balance act, literally doing yoga moves is bringing back the balance into people's lives so they can create that greater headspace um, or headroom. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> We can play that both ways, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> more headspace creates more headroom. Um, but it, it is so critical on the pieces that you talked about, especially when it comes to sleep. Nutrition is a piece of it. And then you brought up some stress and balance. And you do a number of different lectures. And, and like I said previously, when we started, is you're, you're very eclectic. And um, Dr. Wood, I, I think there is a majority of people that for the first time they're starting to look at their brain as one of the most vital organs in their body, mm -hmm. where before they used to look at the heart. Yeah. And and I think there's a distinction now, and maybe you could comment just briefly on um the the differentials between the heart and the brain, because they're they're two organs we can't clearly dissociate from one another and they keep us alive. But talk to me about the importance of the brain versus the heart. 
Yeah, that's um, it, it's funny because in the the biomedical fields, we're very much siloed, right? I, I'm a neuroscientist. I study the brain. Does that mean that I don't think about other parts of the body, right? And this is still sort of very much baked into our society, right? You're a neurologist or you're a cardiologist, right? You're an expert in the heart or in the brain and not in both. Um, and I think over time, we're starting to appreciate that, you know, these things, I said this right at the beginning, are intimately connected. Like, what about the gut versus the brain, right? This is a big area now. And um, actually, at one point, you asked me a, a question that I didn't answer, which is, how much do we know about the brain? And, the, you know, and we could say the same thing about the gut in particular, because that's a, you know, that's an expanding area of research. And in reality, the answer is not very much. And we know a lot less than people may pretend that that we know. Um, and what we do know may be in one strain of mouse in one lab with like huge depths of data. But how does that relate to you or to me or to somebody else? We don't really we don't really know that yet. However, what I, again, I think if we can, we can we draw like lessons that are a little bit more actionable. There's a nice phrase, which is the what's good for the heart is good for the brain, um, which I which I kind of like. Um, and I think in in most cases, that's probably true. Uh, and that's because if you're doing things that are supporting heart health, then you're improving vascular health, you know, those the tubes that your your blood runs through. Um, and there's something in you know, one of the most critical com aspects of uh, headroom, say cognitive headroom, is that when a, a part of your brain becomes more active, this thing called neurovascular coupling happens, which basically means that your neurons become more active, they ask for more blood flow, and we can deliver it. But that requires healthy blood vessels to do that. So then if you're supporting heart health, you're supporting that system, you're also providing that ability to react and respond uh, when the brain needs it. And so what are what are things that are important for heart health? We know diet is important. We know physical activity is important. We know sleep. Uh, is important. We know glucose control is important. We know avoiding, you know, so like air pollution again is is, is a risk factor for for cardiovascular disease. So in general, it's a simple answer because actually most of the things that are important for one uh, are important for the other, and by supporting one, you're also supporting the other, and then there's a synergistic benefit there. Aha! You heard you heard it here, my audience, that the heart, what's good for the heart, is is good for the brain. It was good for the goose is great for the gander. <laughs> so let's let's um, come down to some simplicity because we got from a neurophysiological aspect, we went into biochemistry, went into gut health a little bit on, you know, trying to understand to this might be something we, we do in the future. Cause I know you have a lot in there is does the gut impact the brain? And, mm. and I, I bet you could do a whole hour on that, but, <laughs> but come down to some simple things that we're going to walk away with. We're adjusting our reality. We're recognizing that the brain and the heart are best friends and mm -hmm. that um, if one suffers, I believe truly that the other one does too. So let's talk about three simple ways we can counteract that natural chain and brain function as we age in your thoughts. Yeah. So the first one is that we, I think we should reframe how we think about that change as we age. And I have a good friend, a neurologist, Dr. Josh Turk, and we've written papers together. We have a podcast together called Better Brain Fitness. If anybody wants to to listen to that, where we answer, we it's mainly question and answer. So the audience are, are ask us questions, and we answer them related to brain health. And he's written some nice articles on, you know, this change in cognitive function as we get older. It's not necessarily bad. It's sort of it's it's a natural process. So I'll give a couple of examples. One is that people may say, you know what, it's, it's harder for me to remember things um, as you get older. But part of what our brain is there for is to uh, realize and acknowledge novel things and store those in memory, right? So as you have more experiences, you've seen something several times before, part of your brain's function is to say, I've seen that before, it's not important. So it's not that you're forgetting things, it's that your brain has thought, do you know what, that's actually not very interesting, so I'm going to choose not to remember it. And that's perfectly normal, 
right? Another part of it is that as your hard drive fills up, and it doesn't necessarily get full, but as it fills up, as you have more information stored, it takes a little bit longer to retrieve it. And again, that's not a bad thing. If you don't have much information, it's very quick to access the information you do have. So these are normal things, right? This is the, the that process of, you know, sort of early knowledge versus wisdom. Part of this wisdom is built in, which is saying, you know, I've seen my keys so many times that your brain's just like, this is unimportant information relative to other things. So, right, that's that's maybe why you forget where your keys are because your brain is filtered out as uninteresting. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So I think we can reframe how we think about it. And there's a nice um there was a nice study that looked at how people feel about aging itself. And they they asked they asked people, you know, well, they they separate them into two groups. People who did or didn't have a positive self-perception of aging. So those who thought, do you know what? I'm getting older, I'm getting wiser, this is a part of life, I'm embracing it, this is all good stuff, right? And then there was the other group who had a negative self-perception of aging. They were like, I've got to fight aging. You know, it's a terrible thing. I'm getting older. You know, I'm, I'm getting unhealthy and all these things are bad. And they they looked at then how long those people lived. And those who embraced aging, they had a positive self-perception of aging. They lived longer, right? And there's a whole bunch of stuff that could filter into that around, um, you know, the other aspects of your life and the environment that you live in and, you know, uh various uh, other aspects of mood. But it seems like those who don't actively think that this process of getting older is a bad thing, right? It's just different, right? There's benefit there. So that's the one thing. So maybe reframe some of the things that, that we think about in terms of how our brains and bodies function as, as, as we get older. Then um, the, the second takeaway, uh, I, I think, is that, you know, what is important for health and function across the entire lifespan like it, it it really boils down to these like same core principles regardless of who you are if it, you're at the beginning of life um at the end of life uh, if you're a professional athlete if you're not um and you know it's diet and diet quality um physical activity uh, sleep and probably in there some circadian biology circadian rhythms um some kind of stress management or distress tolerance how how do we uh, you know, able to accept or uh, get rid of or mitigate some some of the stresses that we're exposed to, and then social connection and social interaction, like those five things, right? And you can really dig down deep into all of them, but you know, if you sort of hit those those sort of like high level ideas, that really covers the vast majority of of what's going to keep people healthy and happy for as long as possible. And then the last thing, uh, which again I think is maybe the most important thing for long-term brain health is making sure that we continue to stimulate that tissue. You know, if you um, wanted to be, you know, physically active for your entire life, you you would do exercise for your entire life, right? You wouldn't expect to just be able to sit and do nothing and still maintain your strength and your and your cardiovascular fitness and all that kind of stuff. And the brain is the same. As soon as we stop um, uh, challenging it, uh, stimulating it. Then we start to see that those uh, problems in terms of function and in terms of repair. So learning languages, learning new skills, doing movement that has a, a balanced component, continuing uh, to challenge ourselves and fail, and maybe doing it in a social uh, capacity, right? Learning a language in a group or learning to dance in a group or doing something with others, right? Multiple different things. Um, we're ticking multiple boxes at the same time. Continuous, continuing to challenge our brains is really the most important thing, I believe, in terms of maintaining our cognitive function for as long as possible. I think you just in, took our audience from um, the potential for longevity to the absolute longevity, because there's a <laughs> lot in those uh, three simple ways, but <laughs> but so incredibly important. And, and I do want to leave you with the thought that you created a change in the way we look at things. So the things we look at change. And that is a famous quote from um, Dwayne Dwyer about how life in, a, in and of itself does create a um, a reality for you. And you you choose that. You choose mm -hmm. to decide where your, your life and your health will go. And I think our audience really got a treat today. Dr. Wood, thank you so much for joining us today. It's incredibly important to have people that are so knowledgeable and yet so freely and generously able to share their knowledge base. So I, I give you a very, very special thank you for being with us today. 
Thank you very much for having me. I really, really enjoyed this. It was great. Thank you for tuning in to Adjusted Reality as we spoke to Dr. Tommy Wood about how the brain function changes with age and simple ways to combat these changes, creating the headroom. Our brain is a fabulous organ, and we must continue to explore new brain stimulating options in our own personal lives and the lives of others that we love very much. So what are we going to do? Are we going to pick up a new dance class? Are we going to learn a new sport? How about a new language? These are all things that we can start to add to our life to engage the brain exploring all these new opportunities because it does have a very positive impact. And he also said a positive attitude towards aging is also monumental. We age with wisdom from our past, but we also have to have the excitement for the future. This podcast was brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress as a special gift for listening today with our most respectful opportunity to deliver to you a copy of our Mind, Body, Spirit ebook. You can find it at f4cp.org slash health. You can get that copy and you can share it with the loved ones that you have in your life because it's without drugs or surgery and many opportunities to explore true health and wellness. Now, do not forget to subscribe. Can you share this podcast today with a friend or family member? We'd also love to have you rate and review. If you're feeling so inspired to learn about chiropractic or to find a doctor of chiropractic near you, visit f4cp.org slash find a doctor. We appreciate your support. And as always, look forward to checking in with you again soon.